The Blood Seedling by John Hay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Blood Seedling by John Hay. In a bit of green pasture that rose, gradually narrowing to the tableland that ended in prairie, and widened out descending to the wet and willowy sands that border the great river, a broad-shouldered young man was planting an apple tree one sunny spring morning when Tyler was president. The little valley was shut in on the south and east by rocky hills, patched with the immortal green of cedars and gay with clambering columbines. In front was the Mississippi, reposing from its plunge over the rapids and idling down among the golden sandbars and the low moist islands which were looking their loveliest in the new spring dresses of delicate green. The young man was digging with a certain vicious energy forcing the spade into the black crumbling loom with a movement full of vigor and malice his straight black brows were knitted till they formed one dark line over his deep set eyes his beard was not yet old enough to hide the massive outline of his firm square jaw in the set teeth in the clouded face and the half articulate exclamations that shot from time to time from the compressed lips it was easy to see that the thoughts of the young horticulturist were far from his work a bright young girl came down the path through the hazel thicket that skirted the hillside, and putting a plump brown hand on the topmost rail of the fence, bolted lightly over and lit on the soft springy turf with a thud that announced a wholesome and liberal architecture. It is usually expected of poets and lovers that they shall describe the ladies of their love as so airy and delicate and structured that the flowers they tread on are greatly improved in health and spirits by the visitation. But not being a poet or in love, we must admit that there was no resurrection for the larkspurs and pansies upon which the little boots of Miss Susie Barringer landed. Yet she was not the coarse peasant type, though her cheeks were so rosy as to cause her great heaviness of heart on Sunday mornings, and her blue laundress was as full as it could afford from shoulders to waist she was a neat hearty and very pretty country girl with a slightly freckled face and rippled brown hair and astonished blue eyes but perfectly self-possessed and graceful as a young quail a young man's ears are quick to catch the rustling of a woman's dress the flight of this plump bird in its fluttering blue plumage over the rail fence caused our young man to look up from his spading the scowl was rooted from his brow by a sudden incursion of blushes and his mouth was attacked by an awkward smile the young lady nodded and was hurrying past the scowl came back in force and the smile was repulsed from the bearded mouth with great loss miss tootie are you in a hurry the lady thus addressed turned and said in a voice that was half pert and half coaxing no particular hurry al i've told you a dozen times not to call me that ridiculous name miss tootie i hain't never called you nothin else since you was a little one so high you ought to know your own name and you give yourself that name when you was a yearlin howsomever if you don't like it now since you've been to jacksonville i reckon i can call you miss susie when i don't disremember the frank amend seemed to satisfy miss susie for she at once interrupted in the kindest manner never mind al goya you can call me what you are a mind to then as if conscious of the feminine inconsistency she changed the subject by asking what are you going to do with that great hole big enough to bury a fellow i'm going to plant this here seedling that growed up in colonel blood's pasture nobody knows how be like somebody was eatin an apple and throwed the core down like i'm going to plant a little orchard here next spring but the colonel and me we reckon this one'd be too old by that time for movin so i thought i'd stick it in now and see what'd come out in it it's a powerful thrifty chunk of a sapling yes i speak for the first peck of apples off in it don't forget good morning hold on a minute miss susan twill i get my coat i'll walk down a piece with you i've got something to say to you miss susie turned a little red and a little pale these occasions were not entirely unknown in her short experience of life when young men in the country in that primitive period had something to say it was something very serious and earnest ellen goya was a good-looking stalwart young farmer well-to-do honest able to provide for a family there was nothing presumptuous in his aspiring to the hand of the prettiest girl on cheney creek in childhood he had trotted her to banbury cross and back a hundred times beguiling the tedium of the journey with kisses and the music of bells when the little girl was old enough to go to school the big boy carried her books and gave her the rosiest apples out of his dinner basket he fought all her battles and wrote all her compositions which latter by the way never gained her any great credit when she was fifteen and he twenty he had his great reward in taking her twice a week during one happy winter to sing in school this was the bloom of life nothing before or after could compare with it the blacking of shoes and brushing of stiff electric bristling hair all on end with frost and hope the struggling into the plate armor of his starched shirt the tying of his pretentious and uncontrollable cravat before the glass which was hopelessly dimmed every moment by his eager breath these trivial and vulgar details were made beautiful and unreal by the magic of youth and love then came the walk through the crisp dry snow to the widow barringer's the sheepish talk with the old lady while susie got on her things and the long enchanting tramp to the district schoolhouse there's not a country-bred man or woman now living 
but will tell you that life can offer nothing comparable with the innocent zest of that old style of courting that was done at singing school in the starlight and candlelight of the first half of the century there are few hearts so withered and old but they beat quicker sometimes when they hear in old-fashioned churches the wailing sobbing or exulting strains of bradstreet or china or coronation and the mind floats down on the current of these old melodies to that fresh young day of hopes and illusions of voices that were sweet no matter how false they sang of nights that were rosy with dreams no matter what fahrenheit said of girls that blushed without cause and of lovers who talked for hours about everything but love i know i shall excite the scorn of all the ingenuous youth of my time when i say that there was nothing that our superior civilization would call love-making in those long walks through the winter nights the heart of alan gallier swelled under his satin waistcoat with love and joy and devotion as he walked over the crunching roads with this pretty enslaver but he talked of apples and pigs and the heathen and the teacher's wig and sometimes ventured an allusion to the other people's flirtations in a jocose and distant way but as to the state of his own heart his lips were sealed it would move a blase smile on the downy lips of juvenile lovelaces who count their conquests by their cotillions and think nothing of making a declaration in an avant de to be told of young people spending several evenings of each week in the year together and speaking no word of love until they were ready to name their wedding day yet such was the sober habit of the place and time so there was no troth plighted between ellen and susie though the youth loved the maiden with all the energy of his fresh unused nature and she knew it very well he never dreamed of marrying any other woman than susie barringer and she sometimes tried a new pen by writing and carefully erasing the initials s m g which as she was christened susan minerva may be taken as showing the direction of her thoughts if alan gallier had been less bashful or more enterprising this history would never have been written for susie would probably have said yes for want of anything better to say and when she went to visit her aunt abigail in jacksonville she would have gone engaged her finger bound with gold and her maiden meditations fettered by promises but she went as it was fancy free and there is no tinder so inflammable as the imagination of a pretty country girl of sixteen one day she went out with her easy-going aunt abigail to buy ribbons janey creek invoices not supplying the requirements of jacksonville society as they traversed the courthouse square on their way to deacon pettibone's place miss susan's vagrant glances rested on an iris of ribbon displayed in an opposition window let's go in here she said with the impetuous decision of her age and sex we will go where you like dear said easy-going aunt abigail it makes no difference aunt abigail was wrong it made the greatest difference to several persons whether susie barringer bought her ribbons at simmons or pettibone's that day if she had but known but all unconscious of the fate that beckoned visibly on the threshold miss susie tripped into simmons emporium and asked for ribbons two young men stood at the long counter one was mr simmons proprietor of the emporium who advanced with his most conscientious smile ribbons ma'am yes ribbons ma'am all sorts ma'am cherry ma'am certainly ma'am just got a splendid lot from st louis this morning ma'am this way ma'am the ladies were soon lost in the delight of the eyes the voice of mr simmons accompanied the feast of color insinuating but unheeded the other young man approached here's what you want miss rich and elegant just suits your style sits off your hair and eyes beautiful the ladies looked up a more decided voice than mr simmons whiter hands than mr simmons handled the silken bands bolder eyes than the weak pink bordered orbs of mr simmons looked unabashed admiration into the pretty face of susie barringer look here simmons old boy introduce a fellow mr simmons meekly obeyed mrs barringer let me introduce you to mr leon of st louis of the house of draper and mercer bertie leon at your service said the brisk young fellow seizing miss susie's hand with energy his hand was so much softer and whiter than hers that she felt quite hot and angry about it when they had made their purchases mr leon insisted on walking home with them and was very witty and agreeable all the way he had all the wit of the newspapers of the concert rooms of the steamboat bars at his fingers ends in his wandering life he had met all kinds of people he had sold ribbons through a dozen states he had never had a moment's doubt of himself he never hesitated to allow himself any indulgence which would not interfere with business he had one ambition in life to marry miss mercer and get a share in the house miss mercer was as ugly as a millionaire's tombstone mr bertie leon who when his moustache was not dyed nor his hair greased was really quite a handsome fellow considered that the sacrifice he proposed to make in the interests of trade must be made good to him in some way so by way of getting even he made violent love to all the pretty eyes he met in his commercial travels to have something to think about after he should have found favour in the strabmistic optics of miss mercer he observed disrespectfully simple susie who had seen nothing of young men besides the awkward and blushing clodhoppers of cheney creek was somewhat dazzled by the free and easy speech and manner of the hard-cheeked bagman yet there was something in his airy talk and point-blank compliments that aroused a faint feeling of resentment which she could scarcely account for aunt abigail was delighted with him and when he bowed his adieu at the gate in the most recent planter's house 
house style she cordially invited him to call to drop in any time he must be lonesome so far from home he said he couldn't neglect such a chance with another planter's house bow what a nice young man said aunt abigail awfully conceited and not overly polite said susie as she took off her bonnet and went into a revel of bows and trimmings the oftener albert leon came to miss barringer's bowery cottage the more the old lady was pleased with him and the more the young one criticized him until it was plain to see that aunt abigail was growing tired of him and pretty susan dangerously interested but just at this point his inexorable carpet-bag dragged him off to a neighboring town and susie soon afterward went back to cheney creek her jacksonville hat and ribbons made her what her pretty eyes never could have done the belle of the neighborhood non cuvis contingent adire lutetium but to a village where no one has been at paris the county town is a shrine of fashion alan gollier felt a vague sense of distrust chilling his heart as he saw mr simmons ribbons decking the pretty head in the village choir the sunday after her return and spurred on by a nascent jealousy of the unknown resolved to learn his fate without loss of time but the little lady received him with such cool and unconcerned friendliness and talked so much and so fast about her visit that the honest fellow was quite bewildered and had to go home to think the matter over and cudgel his dull wits to divine whether she was pleasanter than ever or had drifted altogether out of his reach alan gollier was after all a man of nerve and decision he wasted only a day or two in doubts and fears, and one Sunday afternoon, with a beating but resolute heart, he left his Sunday school class to walk down to Crystal Glen and solve his questions and learn his doom. When he came in sight of the window's modest house, he saw a buggy hitched by the gate. Dow Padge is chestnut sorrel by Jing. What is Dow after out here? It is natural, if not logical, that young men should regard the visits of all other persons of their age and sex in certain quarters as a serious impropriety. But it was not his friend and crony, Dow Paget, the livery man, who came out of the widow's door, leading by the hand the blushing and bridling Susie. It was a startling apparition of the southwestern dandy of the period, light hair drenched with bear's oil, blue eyes and jet-black mustache, an enormous paste brooch in his bosom, a waistcoat and trousers that shrieked in discordant tones, and very small and elegant varnished boots the gamblers and bagman of the mississippi river are the best shod men in the world gollier's heart sank with him as the splendid being shone upon him but with his rustic directness he walked to meet the laughing couple at the gate and said tootie i come to see you shall i go in and talk to your mother twill you come back no that won't pay promptly replied the brisk stranger we will be gone the half of the afternoon i reckon this house is awful slow he added with a wink of preternatural mystery to miss susie mr gollier said the young lady let me introduce you to my friend mr leon Gollier put out his hand mechanically after the cordial fashion of the West, but Leon nodded and said, I hope to see you again. He lifted Miss Susie into the buggy, sprang lightly in, and went off with laughter and the cracking of his whip after Dow Paget's chestnut sorrel. The young farmer walked home desolate, comparing in his simple mind his own plain exterior with his rival's gorgeous toilette, his awkward address with the other's easy audacity, till his heart was full to the brim with that infernal compound of love and hate which is called jealousy, from which pray heaven to guide you. It was the next morning that Susie vaulted over the fence, where Alice Gollier was digging the hole for Colonel Blood's apple tree. Something middlin' particular, continued Gollier resolutely. There's no use leaving your work, said Miss Barringer pluckily. I will stay and listen. Poor Alan began as badly as possible. Who was that fellow with you yesterday? Thank you, Miss Gollier. My friends ain't fellas. What's that to you who he was? Susie Barringer, we have been keeping company now a matter of a year i have loved you well and true i would give my life to save you any little care or trouble i have never dreamed of nobody but you not that i was half good enough for you but because i didn't know any better man around here if it ain't too late susie i ask you to be my wife i will love you and care for you good and true before this solemn little speech was finished susie was crying and biting her bonnet strings in a most undignified manner hush i gall you she burst out you mustn't talk so you are too good for me i am kind of promised to that fellow i most wished i had never seen him Alan sprang to her and took her in his strong arms. She struggled free from him. In a moment the vibration which his passionate speech had produced in her passed away. She dried her eyes and said firmly enough, It's no use, Al. We wouldn't be happy together. Goodbye. I shouldn't wonder if I went away from Cheney Creek before long. She walked rapidly down the river road. Alan stood fixed and motionless, gazing at the light, graceful form until the blue dress vanished behind the hill, and leaned long on his spade, unconscious of the lapse of time. When Susie reached her home, she found Leon at the gate. Ah, my little rosebud, I came near missing you. I'm going to Keokuk this morning to be gone a few days. I stopped here a minute to give you something to keep for me till I come back. What is it? He took her chubby cheeks between his hands and laid on her cherry ripe lips a keepsake which he never reclaimed. She stood watching him from the gate until, as a clump of willows snatched him from her, she thought, He will go right by where Al's at work. It would be just like him to jump over the fence and have a talk with him. I'd like to hear it. And an hour or so later, 
as she sat and sewed in the airy little entry a shadow fell upon her work and as she looked up her startling eyes met the piercing glance of her discarded lover a momentary ripple of remorse passed over her cheerful heart as she saw alan's pale and agitated face he was paler than she had ever seen him with that ghastly pallor of weather-beaten faces his black hair wet with perspiration clung clamorily to his temples he looked beaten discouraged utterly fatigued with the conflict of emotion but one who closely looked in his eyes would have seen a curious stealthy half-shaded light in them as of one who though working against hope was still not without resolute will dame barringer who had seen him coming up the walk bustled in good morning alan how beat out you do look now i like a steady young man but don't you think you run this thing a-workin into the ground well maybe so said Gallia with a weary smile leastways i've been a-runnin this spade into the ground all mornin and you want butter milk that's your idea ain't it now well mrs barringer i reckon you know my failin's the good woman trotted off to the dairy and Susie sewed demurely, waiting with some trepidation for what was to come next. "'Susie Barringer,' said a low, husky voice, which she could scarcely recognize as Gallia's, "'I come back to ask pardon, not for nothing I've done, but I never did and never could do you wrong, but for what I thought for a while after you left me this morning. It's all over now, but I tell you, the bad man had his claws into my heart for a spell. Now it's all over, and I wish you well. I wish your husband well. If ever you get into any trouble where I can help, send for me. It's my right. It's the last favor I ask of you.' susceptible susie cried a little again alan watched her with his ambushed eyes said don't take it to heart tooty perhaps there's better days in store for me yet this did not appear to comfort miss barringer in the least she was greatly grieved when she thought she had broken a young man's heart she was still more dismal at the slightest intimation that she had not if any explanation of this paradox is required i would observe quoting a phrase much in vogue among the witty writers of the present age that miss susie barringer was a very female woman so pretty susan's rising sobs subsided into a coquettish pout by the time her mother came in with the foaming pitcher of subacidulous nectar and plied young gallier with brimming beakers of it with all the beneficent delight of a lady bountiful there mrs barringer that's about as much as i can tote temperance in all things very well then you work less and play more we never get a sight of you lately come in neighborly and play checkers with tootie it was the darling wish of mother barringer's heart to see her daughter married and settled with the study young man that you knowed all about and his folks before him she had observed with great disquietude the brilliant avatar of mr bertie leon and the evident pride of her daughter in the bright plumaged captive she had brought to cheney creek the spoil of her maiden snare i don't mourn half like that little feller it is a western habit to call a well-dressed man a little feller the epithet would light on hercules farnese if he could go to illinois dressed as a cocotes no honest folks wears beard unto their upper lips i wouldn't be surprised if he was a gambler day after day wore on and to dame barringer's delight and susie's dismay mr leon had not come alan gallier apparently unconscious in his fatigue of the cap which dame barringer was vicariously setting for him walked away with his spade on his shoulder and the good woman went systematically to work in making susie miserable by sharp little country criticisms of her heart's idol day after day wore on and to dame barringer's delight and susie's dismay mr leon did not come he is such a business man thought susie trusting he can't get away from keokuk but he'll be sure to write so susie put on her sunbonnet and hurried up to the post office any letters for me mr whaler the artful and indefinite plural was not disguised enough for miss susie so she added i was expecting a letter from my aunt no letters here from your aunt nor your uncle nor none of the tribe said old whaler who had gone over with tyler to keep his place and so had no further use for good manners i think old tommy whaler is an imprudent old wretch said susie that evening and i won't go near his old post office again but susie forgot her threat of vengeance the next day and she went again lured by family affection to inquire for that letter which aunt abby must have written the third time she went rummy old whaler roared very improperly bother your aunt you got a bow somewheres that's what's the matter poor susan was so dazzled by this flash of clairvoyance that she hurried from that dreadful post office scarcely hearing the terrible words that the old gin pig hurled after her now he's forgot you that's what's the matter susie barringer walked home along the river road revolving many things in her mind she went to her room and locked her door by sticking a penknife over the latch and sat down to have a good cry her faculties being thus cleared for action she thought seriously for an hour if you can remember when you were a schoolgirl you know a great deal of solid thinking can be done in an hour but we can tell you in a moment what it put it up you can walk through the louvre in a minute but you can't see it in a week susan barringer soliloquiter three weeks yesterday yes i suppose it's so what a little fool i was he goes everywheres says the same things to everybody like he was selling ribbons mean little scamp mother seen through him in a minute i'm mighty glad i didn't tell her nothing about it fie susie your principles are worse than your grammar he'll marry some rich girl i don't envy her but i hate her and i'm as good as she is maybe he will come back no and i hope he won't and i wish i was dead pocket handkerchief 
yet in the midst of her grief there was one comforting thought nobody knew of it she had no confidant she had not even opened her heart to her mother these western maidens have a fine gift of reticence a few of her countryside friends and rivals had seen with envy and admiration the pretty couple on the day of leon's arrival but all their poisonous little compliments and questions had never elicited from the prudent susie more than the safe statement that the handsome stranger was a friend of aunt abby's whom she had met at jacksonville they could not laugh at her they could not sneer at gay deceivers and lovelorn damsels when she went to the sewing circle the bitterness of her tears were greatly sweetened by the consideration that in any case no one could pity her she took consolation from this thought that she faced her mother unflinchingly at tea and baffled the maternal inquest of her redness of eyes by the schoolgirl's invaluable and ever-ready headache it was positively not until a week later when she met alan gollier at choir meeting that she remembered that this man knew the secret of her baffled hopes she blushed scarlet as he approached her have you got company home miss susie yes that is sally withers and me came together and no that's hardly fair to tom fleming three ain't the pleasantest company i will go home with you susie took the strong arm that was held out to her and leaned upon it with a mingled feeling of confidence and dread as they walked home through the balmy night under the clear starry heaven of the early spring the air was full of the quickening breath of may susie barringer waited in vain for some signal of battle from alan gollier he talked more than usual but in a grave quiet protecting style very different from his former manner of worshipping bashfulness his tone had in it an air of fatherly caressing which was inexpressibly soothing to his pretty companion tired and lonely with her silent struggle of the past month when they came to her gate and he said good-night she held his hand a moment with a tremulous grasp and spoke impulsively al i once told you something i never told anybody else i'll tell you something else now because i believe i can trust you be sure of that susie barringer well al my engagement is broken off i am sorry for you susie if you set much store by him miss susie answered with great unnecessary impetuosity i don't care and i'm glad of it and then ran into the house and to bed her cheeks all aflame at the thoughts of her indiscretion and yet with a certain comfort in having a friend from whom she had no secrets i protest there was no thought of coquetry in the declaration which susan barringer blurted out to her old lover under the sympathetic starlight of the may heaven but alan gollier would have been a dull boy not to have taken heart and hope from it he became as of old a frequent and welcome visitor at crystal glen before long the game of checkers with susie became so enthralling a passion that it was only adjourned from one evening to another alan's white shirts grew fringy at the edges with fatigue duty and his large hands were furry at the fingers with much soap susie's affectionate heart which had been swayed a moment from its orbit by the irresistible attraction of bertie leon's diamond breastpin and city swagger swung back to its ancient course under the mild influence of time and the weather and opportunity so that dame barringer was not in the least surprised on entering her little parlour one soft afternoon in the very may to see the two young people economically occupying one chair and susie shouting the useless appeal mother make him behave i never interfere in young folks matters especially when they're going all right said the motherly old soul kissing her son alan and trotting away to dry her happy tears i am almost ashamed to say how soon they were married so soon that when miss susie went with her mother to keokuk to buy a wedding garment she half expected to find in every shop she entered the elegant figure of mr leon leaning over the counter the dress was bought and made and worn at wedding and in fair and in a round of family visits among the barringer and gollier kin and carefully laid away in lavender when the pair came back from their modest holiday and settled down to a real life on alan's prosperous farm and no word of bertie leon ever came to mrs gollier to trouble her joy in her calm and busy life the very name faded from her tranquil mind these wholesome country hearts do not bleed long in that wide-awake country eyes are too useful to be wasting and weeping my dear lothario urbanus these peaches are very sound and delicious but they will not keep forever if you do not secure them to-day they will go to someone else and in no case as the autocrat hath said with authority can you stand there mellering em with your thumb there was no happier home in the country and few finer farms the good sense and industry of gollier and the, and the practical helpfulness of his wife found their full exercise in the care of his spreading fields and growing orchards the warsaw merchants bought for his wheat and his apples were known in st louis mrs gollier with that spice of romance which is hidden away in every woman's heart had taken a special fancy to the seedling apple tree at whose planting she had so intimately assisted ellen shared in this as in all her whims and tended and nursed it like a child in time he gave up the care of his orchard to other hands but he reserved this seedling for his own special codling he spaded and mulched it and pruned it and guarded it in the winter from rodent rabbits and in summer from terebrant grubs it was not ungrateful it grew a noble tree producing a rich and luscious fruit with a deep scarlet satin coat and a flesh tinged as delicately as a pink seashell the first peck of apples was given to susie with great ceremony and the next year the first bushel was carried to colonel blood the congressman he was loud in his admiration as the autumn elections were coming on 
great scott golia i'd rather give my name to a hoard of cultural triumph like that there than be senator you got your wish then colonel said golia me and my wife have called that tree the blood seedling since the day it was transplanted from your pasture it was the pride and envy of the neighbourhood several neighbours asked for scions and grafts but could do nothing with them fact is said old silas withers those folks that expects to raise good fruit by begging grafts and then layin' abed and reading newspapers will have a good time waitin elbow grease is the secret of the blood seedling ain't it al well i reckon squire withers a man never gets anything worth havin without a tussle for it and as to secrets i don't believe in em nohow a square-browed resolute silent middle-aged man who loved his home better than any amusement regular at church at the polls something richer every christmas than he had been on new year's preceding a man whom everybody liked and few loved much such was alan golia grown to be if i have lingered too long over this colourless and commonplace picture of rural western life it is because i have felt an instinctive reluctance to recount the startling and most improbable incident which fell one night upon this quiet neighbourhood like a thunderbolt out of the sky the story i must tell will be flatly denied and easily refuted it is absurd and fantastic but unless human evidence is to go for nothing when it testifies of things unusual the story is true at the head of the rocky hollow through which cheney creek ran to the river lived the family who gave the brook its name they were among the early pioneers of the country in the squatty yellow stone house the present cheney occupied his grandfather had stood a siege from the black hawk all one summer and night until relieved by the garrison of fort edward the family had not grown with the growth of the land like many other of the pioneers they had shown no talent of keeping abreast of civilization whose guides and skirmishers they had been in the progress of a half-century they had sold bit by bit their section of land which kept intact would have proved a fortune they lived very quietly working enough to secure their own pork and hominy and regarding with a sort of impatient scorn every scheme of public or private enterprise that passed under their eyes the elder cheney had married some years before at the mormon town of naboo the fair-haired daughter of a swedish mystic who had come across the sea beguiled by dreams of a perfect theocracy and who on arriving at the city of latter-day saints had died broken-hearted from his lost illusions the only dowry that seraphita nielsen brought her husband besides her delicate beauty and her wide blue eyes was a full set of swedenborg's later writings in english these became the daily food of the solitary household saul cheney would read the exalted rhapsodies of the northern seer for hours together without the first glimmer of their meaning crossing his brain but there was something in the majesty of their language and the solemn roll of their poetical development that irresistibly impressed and attracted him little gershom his only child sitting at his feet would listen in childish wonder to the strange things his silent morose and gloomy father found in the well-worn volumes until his tired eyelids would fall at last over his pale bulging eyes as he grew up his eyes bulged more and more his head seemed too large for his rickety body he pored over the marvellous volumes until he knew long passages by heart and understood less of them than his father which was unnecessary he looked a little like his mother but while she and her youth had something of the faint and flickering beauty of the boreal lights poor gershom never could have suggested anything more heavenly than a foggy moonlight when he was fifteen he went to the neighbouring town of warsaw to school he had rather heavy weather among the well-knit grubby knuckled urchins of the town and would have been thoroughly disheartened but for one happy chance at the house where he boarded an amusement called the sperrits rappins was much in vogue a group of young folks surcharged with all sorts of animal magnetism with some capacity for belief and much more for fun used to gather about a light pine table every evening and put it through a complicated course of mystical gymnastics it was a very good-tempered table it would dance hop or slam at the word of command or if the exercises took a more intellectual turn it would answer any question addressed to it in a manner not much below the average capacity of its tormentors gershom cheney took all this in solemn earnest he was from the first moment deeply impressed he lay awake whole nights with his eyes fast closed in the wildest dreams his school hours were passed in trance-like contemplation he cared no more for punishment than the fakir for his self-inflicted tortures he longed for the coming of the day when he could commune in solitude with the unfleshed and immortal this was the full flowering of, of those seeds of fantasy that had fallen into his infant mind as he lay baking his brains by the wide fire in the old stone house at the head of the hollow while his father read haltingly of the wonders of the invisible world but to his great mortification he saw nothing heard nothing experienced nothing but in the company of others he must brave the ridicule of the profane to taste the raptures which his soul loved his simple trusting faith made him inevitably the butt of the mischievous circle they were not slow in discovering his extreme sensibility to the external influences one muscular black-haired heavy-browed youth took especial delight in practising upon him the table under gershom's tremulous hands would skip like a lamb at the command of this thomas fay one evening tom fay had a great triumph they had been trying to get the medium for gershom had reached that dignity to answer sealed questions and had met with indifferent success 
Fay suddenly approached the table, scribbled a phrase, folded it, and tossed it, doubled up before Gershom, then leaned over the table, staring at his pale, unwholesome face with all the might of his black eyes. Cheney seized the pencil convulsively and wrote, Balaam! Fay burst into a loud laugh and said, Read the question. It was, Who rode on your grandfather's back? This is a specimen of the cheap wit and harmless malice by which poor Gershom suffered as long as he stayed at school. He was never offended, but was often sorely perplexed at the apparent treachery of his unseen counsellors. He was dismissed at last from the academy for utter and incorrigible indolence. He accepted his disgrace as a crown of martyrdom and went proudly home to his sympathizing parents. Here, with less criticism and more perfect faith, he renewed the exercise of what he considered his mysterious powers. His fastings and vigils, and want of bodily movement and fresh air, had so injured his health as to make him tenfold more nervous and sensitive than ever. But his feignings and hysterics and epileptic paroxysms were taken more and more as evidences of his lofty mission his father and mother regarded him as an oracle for the simple reason that he always answered just as they expected a curious or superstitious neighbor was added from time to time to the circle and their reports heightened the half uncanny interest which the cheney household was regarded it was on a moist and steamy evening of spring that all in gallier standing by his gate saw saul cheney slouching along in the twilight and hailed him what news from the spirit saul nothing for you our gallier said saul gloomily the god of this world takes care of the like of you Gallier smiled as a prosperous man always does when his poorer neighbors abuse him for his luck and rejoined, I ain't so fortunate as you think for, Saul Cheney. I lost a box of pig yesterday. I reckon I must come up and ask Gershom what's come of it. Come along if you like. It's been a long while since you crossed my sail, but I'm getting to be quite the style. Young lawyer Marshall is a-coming up this evening to see my Gershom. Before Mr. Gallier started, he filled a basket to make himself welcome and pay for the show with the reddest and finest fruit of his favorite apple tree his wife followed him to the gate and kissed him a rather unusual attention among western farmer people her face still rosy and comely was flushed and smiling al do you know what day of the year it is nineteenth of april yes and twenty years ago today you planted the blood seedling and i give you the mitten she turned and went into the house laughing comfortably Ellen walked slowly up the hollow to the Cheney house and gave the apples to Seraphita and told her their story. A little company was assembled, two or three Cheney Creek people, small market gardeners, with eyes the color of their gooseberries and hands the color of their currants. Mr. Marshall, a briefless young barrister from Warsaw, with a tawny friend who spoke like a Spaniard. "'Take seats, friends, and form a circle of harmony,' said Saul Cheney. "'The medium is in fine condition. He had two fits this afternoon." Gershom looked shockingly ill and weak. He reclined in a great hickory armchair, with his eyes half open, his lips moving noiselessly. All the persons present formed a circle and joined hands. The moment the circle was completed by Saul and Seraphita, who were on either side of their son, touching his hands, an expression of pain and perplexity passed over his pale face, and he began to writhe and mutter. "'He's singing visions,' said Saul. "'Yes, yeah, too many of them,' said Gershom querously. "'A boy in a boat, a man on a shelf, a man with a spade.' all at once too many get me a pencil one at a time i'll tell you one at a time the circle broke up and a table was brought with writing materials gershom grasped a pencil and said with imperious and feverish impatience come on now and don't waste the time of the shining ones an old woman took his right hand he wrote with his left very rapidly an instant and threw her the paper always with his eyes shut close old mrs scritcher read with difficulty a boy in a boat over he goes and burst out in a piteous wail oh my poor little ephraim i always knowed it silence woman said the relentless medium mr marshall said saul would you like a test no thank you said the young gentleman i brought my friend mr baldassano who as a traveller is interested in these things will you take the medium's hand mister what's your name the young foreigner took the lean and feverish hand of gershom and again the pencil flew rapidly off the paper he pushed the manuscript from him and snatched his hand away from baldassano as the latter looked at what was written the tawny cheek grew deadly pale dios mio he exclaimed to marshall this is written in castilian the two young men retired to the other end of the room and read by the tallow candle the note scrawled on the paper baldassano translated a man on a shelf table covered with bottles beside him man's face yellow as gold bottles tumble over without being touched what nonsense is that said marshall my brother died of yellow fever at sea last year both the young man became suddenly very thoughtful and observed with great interest the results of gallier's test he sat by gershom holding his hand tightly but gazing absently into the dying blaze of the wide chimney he seemed to have forgotten where he was. A train of serious thought appeared to hold him completely under its control. His brows were knit with an expression of severe, almost fierce determination. At one moment his breathing was hard and thick, a moment after hurried and broken. All this while the fingers of Gershom were flying rapidly over the paper, independently of his eyes, which were sometimes closed and sometimes rolling, as if in trouble. A wind which was gathering all the evening now came moaning up the hollow, rattling the window blinds, and twisting into dull complaint the boughs of the leafless trees. Its voice came chill and cheerless into the dusky room where the fire was now glimmering near its death. 
and the only sounds were those of gershom's rushing pencil the whispering of marshall and his friend and old mother scritcher feebly whimpering in her corner the scene was sinister suddenly a rushing gust blew the door wide open gollier started to his feet trembling in every limb and looking furtively over his shoulder out into the night quickly recovering himself he tried to resume his place but the moment he dropped Gershom's hand, the medium had dropped his pencil, and had sunk back in his chair in a deep and death-like slumber. Gallia seized the sheet of paper, and with the first line that he read, a strange and horrible transformation was wrought in the man. His eyes protruded, his teeth chattered, he passed his hand over his head mechanically, and his hair stood up like the bristles on the back of a swine in rage. His face was blotched white and purple. He looked piteously about him for a moment, then crumpling the paper in his hand, cried out in a hoarse, choking voice, Yes, it's a fact, I done it, it's no use denying on it here it is in black and white everybody knows it ghosts come spookin about to tattle about it what's the use of lying i done it he paused as if struck by a sudden recollection then burst into tears and shook like a tree in a high wind in a moment he dropped on his knees and in that posture crawled over to marshall here mr marshall here's the whole story for god's sake spare my wife and children all you can fix my property all right for em and god bless you for it even while he was speaking with a certain revulsion of feeling he rose to his feet with a certain return of his natural dignity and said but they shan't take me none of my kin ever died that way i got too much sand in my gizzard to be took that way good-bye friends all he walked deliberately out into the wild windy night marshal glanced hurriedly at the fatal paper in his hand it was full of the capricious detail with which in reverie we review the scenes that are past but a line here and there clearly enough told the story how he went out to plant the apple tree how susie came by and rejected him how he passed into the power of the devil for the time how bertie leon came by and spoke to him and patted him on the shoulder and talked about city life how he hated him and his pretty face and his good clothes how they came to words and blows and he struck him with a spade and he fell into the trench and he buried them there at the roots of the tree marshall following his first impulse thrust the paper into the dull red coals it flamed for an instant and flew with a sound like a sob up the chimney they hunted for Gallia all night but in the morning found him lying as if asleep with a piece of expiation on his pale face his pruner knife in his heart and the red current of his life tinging the turf with crimson around the roots of the blood seedling and the blood seedling by john hay